و نیخون کرده که ما بخش خواهد لکتلی مارگراکشی کپ کن لاور آگم انارا مارفرانتنس سو مارا کتلی نی بخش نبروالی جیمتان رایس سو هیز on the liner, coming home, the last chapter of the, well, almost the last chapter of the book. The next day we were to land in Galway. The great liner was thrashing her way through heavy seas and the severest storm she had met since leaving New York. Giant waves struck her, making her shudder from stem to stern. Deck seats were torn adrift and thrown here and there. Nobody slept. Towards morning, it calmed down considerably. Those of us who were to land in Galway were up before the dawn. The liner was making direct for the old city of the tribes. She would pass to the south of the Aran Islands, which I had left 21 years ago and never visited since. With the first streak of dawn, a light glimmered in the distance. It was from the lighthouse on the most westerly of the two little rocks that lie outside Aaron Moor. My grandfather on the mother's side, one Thomas Gandley, built it some 80 years ago. He came to Aaron building lighthouses and piers. There he met my grandmother, who was the descendant of a colourful character who went by the name of Michal Ruyavoch, speckled Michael. Michal was a successful smuggler and had picked out a nice grassy plot for himself in the village of Meinestid, there to end his days when he got weary of smuggling. My grandfather liked Meinestid and decided to drop anchor there. But he had not much interest in farming and what little he had never resulted in profit. He could not tell his own sheep from a neighbour's. And one day, as he was passing by one of his fields, he saw a number of sheep in it, which he mistook for those of a villager, for whose honesty he had little regard. Bad luck to that thieving Pat Moore, he muttered, as he knocked down the gap and drove the sheep to the pound. Returning home, he threatened to flog his son for not keeping an eye on the land. My grandmother wept and said he would send her to the poorhouse. He had to pay tuppence each to get his own sheep out of the pound. <laughs> the lighthouse is there as solid as ever, but the engineer who built it is dust. I felt anything but cheerful approaching my island home, or what was once my home. My parents and many of my boyhood friends were in the graveyards. Most of my other associates had gone to America to make their fortunes. The sight of the lighthouse and the thoughts of my blood relationship with it had a galvanizing effect on me. After all, I was closer to the things that mattered in this barren island than I was in the materially richer country whence I came. The liner sped on and now we could see the outline of Aaron Moore like a flat green cloud on the horizon. I stood as if glued to the rail recollections chasing each other through my mind. Brannock Island can be seen now. Then, across a narrow channel, the village of Bungaula. At Bungaula, the island slopes down to the sea on every side. Small fields could be seen here and there among the rocks. Almost every rood of cultivated land in Bungaula was made by the people. On goes the liner, and we are now opposite Craigiecadeen. The land rises sharply from Bungaula and from the shore on the Connemara side of the island and steeply to a height of 250 feet on the south. The land here in Craigiecadeen is even, even poorer than in Bungaula, though that seems impossible. <laughs> the cow droppings are used as a substitute for peat and but for the constant fertilizing of the land with seaweed it would in time produce neither grass nor vegetables. The island is peatless and almost treeless. And when the peasant fishermen have not enough money to buy turf from the Connemara men, or when the weather is so bad that the turf boats cannot come in, 
they are obliged to burn dry dung as fuel. In fact, dry cow dung makes a bright, clean fire, and the more thrifty of the islanders never allow a bit of it to go to waste. Experts in cow dung could tell you what kind of cattle feed produces the best substitute fuel for turf. <laughs> we pass Craigiechadine. The cliffs grow taller. We are opposite Onacht, the site of one of the four forts in Aran Moor. Archaeologists are in doubt about the origin of these fortresses, when they were built or by whom. But I came to the conclusion that the builders had a keen appreciation of the value of land, for this and the other forts in the island command the choicest pieces of land in Aran Moor. From the tall cliffs on the south of Onacht to the sloping beach on the north, there is a fairly decent pasturage. Water is abundant. There are some large fields on which the soil is from four to six inches deep, while the shore on the Connemara side is one of the best in the island for seaweed. This stretch of land once belonged to the peasantry of Onacht, but a namesake of mine took a fancy to it and gave the tenants the choice of accepting their transportation to America or being thrown out on the road without any compensation. Some of them went to America and others stayed at home. Many things have happened in Ireland since then, but the descendants of those tenants are still landless. The land grabber's heirs lost Onacht, as well as another section that was acquired in a somewhat like manner. My father, who was the chief leader of the Land League movement in Arran, was one of those responsible for the land grabber's tribulations. Yet it came to pass that a sister of mine married the man who purchased the estate. My brother-in-law paid for this farm with money he earned in the United States and there was no odium attached to his acquisition of it. I am glad when I see the noble fort of Dunangus cresting the tallest cliff in the island, 300 feet from sea level. It awakens more pleasant memories. The fort comprises three rings of horseshoe-shaped walls overlooking Port Murphy and the best land in Arran. This is where the land grabber's cattle were walked blindfolded over the cliff during the stirring days of the Land League. But for the Land League, the whole island might have been his, by grace of the landlord. Near Perthwidivy, on the bay side, is the village of Kilmurvy. The villagers were allowed to live on the land the grabber thought not worth taking. For generations, they have been hauling sand from the seashore, mixing it with seaweed and silt from the roads, and turning bare rocks into tillage land. Someone has written that angels from heaven must have poured down blessings on the bare flags of Arran. Otherwise, the land could not produce the finest cattle and sheep in Ireland and excellent crops of potatoes. It is quite possible that the angels took a friendly interest in the island if for no other reason than because of the number of saints who settled there and built monasteries. But it must be admitted that the angels were ably assisted by the hard-working peasants who broke rocks with sledges, levelled out the area about to be made, carried precious soil in creels on their backs, and oftentimes fought fierce battles with rivals to gain possession of the loam to mix with the loose sand and yellow clay. The Gaeltacht peasant is oftentimes charged with laziness by superior persons from other parts of Ireland who themselves failed to make a living out of good tillage and pasture land. <laughs> but if any one of these critics had to rear a family of from 10 to 14 children on 16 or 24 acres of Arden Moor, or the other two islands in the chain, he would have a different story. We pass Dun Angus. The landscape now becomes even more familiar. There is the cliff of the swan, the swan, sorry, and the blind sound, where the steep descent of the land from Dun Angus stops. Underneath the cliff at this spot, the sea has bored a deep hole, 
For centuries, the ocean has waged a winning battle against the rock. It aims to cut the island in two. Time is on its side and the sea is patient. I see the yellow rock where I caught my first bollock and the wormhole, that remarkable oblong hole like a Roman bath carved out of the limestone flag. It ebbs and flows through an underground passage. There should be a legend about the wormhole, but if there is, I never heard it. It's about time one should be invented. <laughs> now, we are opposite Perth Veladun and the village of Gurtnagopal. An ancestor of mine by the name of Bartholomew founded Gurtnagopal. I am sorry he did not pick a choicer location. Bartholomew built his house upon a rock, not for reasons of security, or because he considered the rock symbolical of continuity, but because he did not want to waste a piece of good pasture or tillage land under a house. Directly opposite Gartnagopal is the village of Oat Quarter, where in the old schoolhouse, now a ruin, David O'Callaghan taught me to read and write my native language 30 odd years ago. My most treasured recollection of Oat Quarter National School is the memory of Roger Casement, tall and thin, his black beard accentuating the pallor of his countenance. I believe he was British consul at Lisbon at the time. He visited the schoolhouse and told the teacher he would like to know if he had a pupil who could grind his way through Ono Nyachtan's column in the Cork Examiner. The teacher fondled his luxuriant brown beard and smiled. Indeed I have, he said. I was called to the front and came out of the test with drums beating. Sir Roger gave me half a crown and afterwards sent me three books. The Story of Ireland by A.M. Sullivan, Shana by Father O'Leary, and Fairies at Work by William P. Ryan, then the editor of The Irish Peasant. The two latter books were in Gaelic. Later, Sir Roger planned to send me to Summerhill College, but fate intervened and the project fell through. Mr. O'Callaghan did great work. He was no cheap jingo nationalist of the type who froths at the mouth at the mention of an Englishman, but he hated British imperialism with all its works and pomps. He was the first Sinn Féiner in the island and had no difficulty in making one of me. My father threw in his lot with us when he learned that there were not more than 400 Sinn Féiners in all Ireland. He was a strong believer in minorities and was always ready to side with the underdog. The cliffs are rising steadily again since we left Perthfell the Doom, the only beach on the south side of the island. The next village is Cowruch, which means conflict. The English post office name for the hamlet is meaningless, like the phonetic atrocities that go for names of places all over Ireland. Cowruch is distinguished for having the best seaweed shore in Arran Moor and for being the site of the Church of the Four Beautiful Saints, set in a sheltered plot where the grass grows long and green all the year round. Next comes the village of Bailan the Craige, which is, as the name implies, unusually rocky. The next townland is Ochel, the site of one of the two Catholic churches in the island, a fort and an old disused lighthouse. Shepelonachta hadn't been built at that time. There are now three Catholic churches in the island. The chapel is on the sloping lawn over the road looking, overlooking the bay. Here I served mass when a boy and when I had outgrown the soutane, my brother Liam took my place and my soutane. How I used to envy the men and the young boys of my own age who lay on the grass outside the church before mass, talking and laughing while I and my associate altar boy stood in the sacristy waiting for the arrival of the priest. And how great used to be my satisfaction in ringing the bell and seeing the idlers on the lawn jump to their feet and make a rush for a seat in the gallery. The steamer is streaking her way rapidly over the smooth sea. 
but she's not moving more rapidly than my thoughts. One moment I am in Aaron, the next in Boston, New York, Chicago, Montana, London, Paris, Berlin, Moscow. From Aaron with its primitive economy to America, the last word in industrial efficiency. From Aaron, where nobody got rich or even wished for riches, to America, where some made fabulous fortunes and almost everybody hoped his turn would come. Leaving Aaron when the world was peaceful and full of hope. Returning when the world is black with despair and world war rumours in the air. Leaving Aaron 21 years ago with the Union Jack flying over police barrack and Coast Guard station. Returning to see the tricolour of a free state of 26 of our 32 counties flying in its place. A tricolour designed to be the flag of an all-Ireland republic. Intervening years of civil war and bloodshed. Millions of human lives sacrificed to human greed. We are now opposite the little village of Manishtit. Smuggling, sorry, snuggling, unseen by me, under the hills overlooking a small bay. The village that was more home to me than my native Gurtnagopal. It was my mother's birthplace. And I liked the emotional, soft, witty, storytelling Ganleys <coughs> better than the harsh, quarrelsome, haughty, ferocious O'Flaherty's. Dundu Chahar strikes the eye. It's the last of the forts in Aran Moor. We are now in line with Kilronan, the largest village on the island. <coughs> Next comes Kilaney, a fishing village of landless peasants forced to depend entirely on the sea for their existence. Beyond Kilaney, called after Aran's greatest saint, Enda, is the graveyard on the sandy mound over a long strand. Here is where the bones of my people rest. We pass Eornia, the most easterly village, and sand swept. We sight the lighthouse on Straw Island at the entrance to Kilronan. We pass Gregory's Sound, Inishman, the Fowl Sound, and then Inishir. Now, we are heading for the great Bay of Galway. I look backwards at the islands that are now flattening themselves out like blue mists on the horizon. And a pang goes through me, as it did 21 years before, when they faded from my view. But only for a moment. I'll be back in a few days.